So good evening. My name is Kathy Coyne. I'm the director of Delaware Sea Grant. I'd like to welcome you to the second Ocean Currents Lecture of 2021. This series is presented by the Delaware Sea Grant College Program and the College of Earth, Ocean and Environment at the University of Delaware. Tonight, we will hear from Delaware Sea Grant's Coastal Hazard Specialist, Danielle Swallow, about coastal flooding and community resilience. First, just a couple of housekeeping notes. This presentation is going to be recorded and will be available for review at a later date. The chat is open for you, the audience, to share comments or to chat with each other during the presentation, but please use the Q&A feature to submit any questions that you have for Danielle. I'll then return after Danielle's presentation to ask those questions of Danielle and we'll try to get through as many as possible in the hour that we have. So now I'd like to turn this over to our speaker this evening, Danielle Swallow. Thank you very much, Kathy. I'm going to get my screen up and thumbs up if you can see it, right, Kathy? Looks good? Looks good. Okay. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Danielle Swallow and I'm happy to be here to talk with you about coastal flooding and community resilience. Um, today, I'm going to break out my presentation into three parts, understanding risk, um, with a focus on coastal flooding in Delaware, because that's the, the area that I focus in here uh, with Delaware Sea Grant. And part two of the presentation will make the case for uh, community resilience and taking steps to prepare for more resilience. Part three will include uh, information or building blocks for building resilience, both at a community or homeowner level. Um, but first, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I have a bachelor's in political science from Wellesley College and a master's in urban planning with a focus on infrastructure and environmental planning from NYU. And I've spent over 20 years uh, in the federal, state, government, and now at the University of Delaware through Sea Grant integrating science into policy and planning decisions. So I've ha held various capacities, including program management and policy coordinator positions in, a, in some of the areas that are on the slide. Uh, the last 10 years, I've been focusing on um, climate and coastal resilience, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, I've been with Delaware Sea Grant for about three and a half years now. The mission of Sea Grant is to enhance the use and conservation of coastal and marine resources in order to create a sustainable and resilient society. My role as a coastal hazard specialist is to help communities and stakeholders better understand their risks to changing weather and climate conditions and to really inform planning and preparedness practices to improve resilience. So we're gonna launch into the first part of the presentation, which is understanding risk of coastal flooding. And I'd like to invite you to use the chat box if you'd like to share with one another um, cases of flooding that you might've experienced in Delaware or even in other parts of the country and how that might've impacted you. And I'm just gonna go ahead and, and uh, launch into this risk um, discussion. So we start off with a fairly basic concept. Delaware regularly floods. And some of this flooding is good. We are a very low lying state. We are the lowest lying state in the nation as it turns out. And we had, and no community is more than 12 miles from a tidal tributary. So every day during our normal tide cycles, there's parts of the state that are gonna naturally flood. And that's okay because the floodplain has natural functions that are beneficial to our society. It helps support healthy habitats and water quality um, it provides conveyance channels to manage floodwaters and absorb floodwaters. So there's a whole host of benefits that uh, a functioning floodplain brings to our, our state and our society. But there's a double-edged sword to flooding as well. Um, flooding can also be a hazard. And in our, in our state of Delaware, it's the number one hazard, according to the state's hazard mitigation plan. And if we were to break out coastal flooding into sort of what are the different inputs or causes, um, we break it out into four main things. Um, next slide will show you the first one is heavy precipitation events. So these are like your thunderstorms or your other big rain dumpers that just dump a lot of rain in a short amount of time. As in the case um, in November of 2020 when um, nearly four inches fell near Trolley Square in Wilmington. 
you know, storms like that, they can inundate your stormwater infrastructure. Um, they could overtop creeks and really inundate low lying areas. Um, the state recently broke uh, its all time 24 hour precipitation re record. Um, it's actually from 2016, but we, we just learned about it according to Dan Leathers, our state climatologist. And that was because there was an event in, Har in Harbison where they, it was recorded that we had 12.48 inches of rain in a 24 hour period. So th that's a major rain event that's gonna naturally inundate and overwhelm a lot of infrastructure. But there's also our typical coastal storms that um, tend to make headlines, you know, the, the tropical and extra tropical systems that, that come through. Um, you know, extra tropical systems refers to nor'easters, which our state is, is fairly vulnerable to. Um, tropical could be depressions, tropical storms, and hurricanes. And you can see I've posted the 2021 Atlantic hurricane season outlook, which NOAA has issued for this year which is basically projecting an above normal season, um, which in terms of being above normal means um, that they anticipate three to five major hurricanes that would be classified as category three or higher. But Delaware has, has been fortunate. We haven't had a lot of direct hits by you know, hurricanes, but it doesn't take a hurricane to bring a lot of coastal flooding and also erosion and wind and you know sort of the other effects that come with coastal storms. In 2019, in October, there was a subtropical storm, uh, Melissa, that formed offshore New Jersey, a couple hundred miles, I think. And it never made landfall, never came any closer than that to us, but it still brought quite a lot of coastal flooding as, uh, as the picture from South Beth Bethany shows. Um, and, and our hurricane season is off to a start. You know, it, uh, the, the start of the season is in June, but NOAA is actually considering um, whether to expand the season so that it might start earlier in the future because we are seeing a, a more uh, frequent recurrence of storms being named earlier and earlier in the year. Um, just earlier in this week, we had the second named storm of the season form not too far off our coast, but fortunately is not has already dissipated, it's not projected to be any worry for us. Another type of flooding is tidal flooding. Um, these, you know, they, another name might be nuisance flooding or sunny tide flooding. And this occurs um, at high tide when low lying parts of the state um, might get inundated for a period of time. Um, and we see an exponential increase of tidal flooding in Delaware as recorded at our Lewis tide cage. Um, and NOAA says that high tide flooding is accelerating at 75% of locations along the East and Gulf Coast. And we're likely to see more of this as time goes on. And why? Well, because there's sea level rise. And sea level rise exacerbates flooding from all of those other inputs. Um, tidal flooding, heavy precipitation, and, and coastal storm events. Um, sea level rise appears as an increase in the average tide height over time. So the low tide is higher, the high tide is higher. And in Delaware, our rate of sea level rise is twice the global average. There's going to be a presentation by John Callahan and Philip Barnes at the end of August as part of the Ocean Currents Lecture Series on sea level rise. So I really encourage you to dive into that. It's gonna be a more in-depth discussion of sea level rise and what are some of the natural and human uh, causes of that. But, to, but for our purposes, it's helpful to know that we have state sea level rise projections, which gives a 95% confidence that sea level rise will not exceed 1.9 feet um, in Delaware by the year 2050. But that means we still have to prepare for that nearly two feet potentially of sea level rise. What are the implications you know, of sea level rise and the exacerbation of flooding that we might anticipate over the next few years? Well, as you can see in this graphic, because the high tide line is basically um, moving higher over time, that means that when we do have storms, you have a storm surge on top of that new high tide line. So you have additional water moving ashore and that moves the floodplain further ashore. And so the floodplain is changing. There is a potential that more houses will need flood insurance. We'd have potentially less viable land to build on because there might be more repetitive flooding you know, due to um, storm conditions and tidal flooding. 
We could also anticipate damage to property and infrastructure. Um, with flooding, we had, especially from the coast, we're gonna have potential for more erosion. So you could see dune erosion, um, damage to boardwalks and infrastructure, roadways and so forth. We can potentially see and are seeing loss of agricultural productivity when um, saltwater intrusion takes place or it overtops the fields. We also see erosion and degradation of natural resources because we lose habitat as sea level rise advances ashore um, and wetlands potentially would normally be able to migrate um, or, or bordered by land development, which prevents their migration. And so you can see degradation of, of wetlands in the future. And this also, um, the flooding and sea level rise also has implications for evacuations. Um, there are several evacuation routes in Delaware that have low-lying parts that are vulnerable to flooding. And certainly with um, the onset of more sea level rise, um, that has implications for these roadways being functional and intact and able to carry out uh, our residents during an evacuation. So we've talked a bit about the hazard, right? Coastal flooding and sort of what causes it. And then it's important though, when we think about risk to really look at risk as an intersection of the hazard, the vulnerability of people, places and things and the exposure of them to the hazard. So exposure refers to what the people, property, and natural and built systems, such as our wetlands or our built infrastructure, like our stormwater systems, it refers to them being in the path of, of the hazard. So just because something's in the path of the hazard doesn't necessarily mean it will be vulnerable to the hazard or you know, risk some major impact. That's actually a function called vulnerability. And vulnerability refers to the sensitivity or the adaptive capacity of people, properties, and systems. So adaptive capacity means whether they're able to adapt and accommodate the flooding or you know, manage the flooding in a way that's not too impactful. And if I start at the bottom, um, in terms of thinking about our natural and built infrastructure, the condition of the infrastructure really matters. If we have degraded wetlands um, or wetlands that are not capable of migrating because they're bordered by development, then they're more sensitive and have less capacity to adapt to sea level rise and flooding, particularly the onset of sea level rise, um, which would mean that they're, they're stuck, they can't migrate. And built infrastructure you know, can become more um, susceptible to um, inundation of saltwater, which could corrode some of the pipes. Um, and there could be capacity limitation, limitations that prevent um, stormwater conveyance systems from handling all the stormwater. In terms of property, you know, the way we build and design our properties really matter. If we're elevating structures or avoiding building in the most high risk zones of the floodplain, then we're sort of helping to minimize vulnerability to, uh, you know, to flooding. And our population, you know, our population is made of a composite of lots of different types of individuals. And as we saw during COVID, there's a number of types of individuals that are more disproportionately impacted by severe events than others. And this includes our Hispanic and black communities, um, low income families, and, and even older adults. And older adults has been a focus of my extension out, outreach in Delaware because Delaware is the 10th fastest aging state in the nation. And we see a lot of older adults moving to the area because of the great natural amenities that Delaware provides, but where are they moving to? Well, they're moving to the coast, into the floodplain. So they're increasing their exposure at a time in their lives where they're potentially more sensitive and have less capacity to adapt. Consider someone that is retired, they're out of the workforce. Perhaps their, their family lives out of state. And if their house incurs a lot of damage due to flooding, they might have a less uh, a harder ability to recover as quickly uh, compared to someone that was in the workforce. And if they have health and mobility challenges, that also could complicate their recovery. So I've been working with colleagues um, from the Institute of Public Administration, Nicole Minnie and Julie O'Hanlon, 
on kind of looking at older adults and emergency preparedness and aging in place more holistically. And so this, this map shows uh, in the small subset, the state of Delaware where the dark gray area at the bottom represents uh, communities with more than 30% of the population being over the age of 65. And you can see predominantly that's in the southeastern part. The larger graphic shows also that coloration. So this is kind of honing in on the long neck area um, of, of Southeast Delaware, where we have a high concentration of older adults. And it's overlaid with uh, coastal inundation information. So it's showing uh, flood inundation potential in one foot increments. And it's using a basic bathtub model. So it's basically looking at low lying areas to see what could become inundated um, with one, two, three, or four feet of additional inundation, or let's say tide, this does not represent storminess conditions. So imagine this is really just a sunny day kind of representative model, but it shows that, you know, what areas are at high risk of flooding. Imagine if there is a storm breezing through with a lot of wind and storm uh, tide on top of the normal tide, you can really see that this area is quite vulnerable. The other thing that the, the slide shows is that there are red transportation routes. These are our state designated evacuation routes. And if you look in at Long Neck, um, parts of Route 1 along the corridor uh, of the coast um, and other parts of, this, of the area, you can see that there's parts of the evacuation routes that are highly vulnerable to flooding. Um, the other thing you can notice from this is that there are segments where we have an older adult population, like in, um, like in Angola, who might be living in, um, you know, neighborhoods that are not that close to the primary evacuation route. So they have to take a lot of tertiary and secondary roads to get there, and those roads have the potential to flood. So I think this, this map is kind of a good composite of trying to understand risk in a holistic way because it's showing the hazard, which is coastal flooding, which is particularly applicable to this area. And then it's showing the exposure of both older adults and transportation infrastructure to the hazard. And it's showing that both older adults have a potential to be vulnerable, as well as the infrastructure. If it's being inundated and not well-maintained, then of course it's, it's gonna be out of commission for a period of time. And so then we can really get a more comprehensive sense of risk. And what that enables us to do is to plan more comprehensively for the needs of the community in the future. And that's really what gets us to, um, you know, the idea of community resilience and, and planning and in, you know, in advance to promote resilience. So I use that word a lot, what is resilience? Well, re resilience refers to the ability to bounce back after disruptive events. Resilience is very proactive and anticipatory. It's thinking about future conditions and planning now to help address those conditions and minimize risk. And the idea is that we try to bounce back and regain some normalcy, but ideally we're trying to bounce back even better. We're trying to bounce back stronger and more equitably so that all members of our community are receiving the benefits of that resilience planning. And you know, bouncing back has a time factor to it. it. How long does it take to recover and to return to some sort of normal? If you were to talk to residents in Texas, uh, the ones that were impacted by Hurricane Harvey in 2017, that was the storm that dumped about 50 inches of rain in a short amount of time. And a 2020 study found that uh, three years after that event, 20% of those residents that were displaced were still in temporary housing. That's an incredibly long amount of time to be displaced. Their recovery you know, is really stretching out. And so that really affects the overall resilience of the community, particularly to successive flooding and storm events, which unfortunately Texas has experienced a lot of. And so you're really having a very vulnerable population um, if they're unable to recover from the first event and then they're going to be less likely to recover and rebound quickly from the next event. That also relates to built infrastructure too. This graphic um, basically describes functionality challenges. 
If you were to look at the dotted line associated with B with an aging system, let's use the example of a transportation road, roadway. Um, if that roadway is not well maintained um, and if it's aging, um, then if you were to have a major flooding event and that's in the, that road's in a low lying area, there's gonna be parts of that road that become inundated for a long period of time and take it out of service. That road could be an evacuation route so the functionality would be really, uh, you know, really sorely missed during, uh, during an event. And that functionality could be out for a while. You know, functionality can be measured in terms of minutes and hours and days or even months, depending on the situation and the infrastructure. But if that roadway were to have been well-maintained and perhaps elevated, um, that would be represented by the dotted line A, which is up here, then if that experienced the same storm event, um, you might have some functionality you know, impact. Maybe it does get flooded, but it'll be flooded for a shorter period of time because the road's been elevated and that functionality is regained much sooner. And so ultimately you are um, reducing the loss of functionality um, over time, which helps improve resilience and bouncing back. And that's why with resilience, you know, we really encourage uh, that folks think about, think about it in a comprehensive way. Um, at the community level, it means, you know, integrating future conditions, demographic changes, land use changes, environmental changes into all aspects of planning, land use planning, social services and emergency response, natural resource management, infrastructure planning, et cetera. And resilience planning can be carried out at different scales from the federal level down to the property owner. My next uh, slides are really gonna focus more on the community and property owner level. And by community, I'm referring to in, you know, incorporated towns, but even um, homeowners associations can function like a community where they band together, they could issue policies and work as, as a neighborhood association would work together. And why, why should they adopt a resilience framework and carry out some resilience planning? Well, according to FEMA, just one inch of water in a home could cost more than $25,000 in damage. And if we invest in mitigation strategies, which are designed to minimize risk, well, for every dollar invested in a mitigation strategy, we save $6 in future damages. So the living shoreline, for example, in the picture, that's showing a natural nature-based infrastructure that helps absorb floodwaters and attenuate waves. And so those kind of investments at a community scale can really save uh, costs in the future from flood damage. And we know that we're experiencing flooding more, more often. Um, the state uh, DENREC carried out a State of Delaware Climate Perception Survey in 2019, which was an update of a survey from 2014. And 56% of the respondents, and they were, by the way, they pulled folks from every part of the state. They said that they have personally experienced or observed local impacts of climate change. And 47% said they have personally experienced or observed local impacts of sea level rise, which is up from 28% in 2004. And the numbers were actually higher for Sussex County, but this was the average for the state. So people are already experiencing impacts. Um, so now I'm going to talk about building blocks. There's many, many strategies that go into resilience planning. And I'm just going to identify a few of them that I feel like are particularly important for, for Delaware to think about. As a property owner, a homeowner, it starts with kind of assessing your risk. It's like, this is critical. No matter where you live in the state, you know, perhaps you might, might wanna consult the DENREC flood planning tool, which the link is at, uh, at the bottom here and, and see where, you are, where your property is in relation to the federally designated floodplain. If you're in a high risk zone, it's going to note your base flood elevation, which refers to the elevation at which flood waters um, might be expected during a 1% or 100 year storm. And knowing the elevation of your property, particularly your first floor habitable level, that's particularly important because then you can take, compare that to the base flood elevation level. 
So you can obtain an elevation certificate for your property. And also think about your utilities and important documents and other household items that are in your house. Are they above the base flood elevation? If not, you might wanna consider relocating them, um, elevating utilities where possible. If you have um, a property with, that borders culverts or you know, storm water drains and swales, you wanna look at the condition of those. Um, are, are there a lot, is there a lot of debris you know, clogging up uh, of the system because debris can really get in the way of that stormwater feature functioning as it properly should. And as you think holistically about your own property, don't just think about today's conditions, how often it rains and how hard it rains, but think about what future conditions might be like. The fact that we anticipate more storm intensification, more rainfall falling at a heavier rate over a shorter period of time. Um, we anticipate, you know, rising water table and, and high tides being higher. So anticipate all of that as you calculate your risk. At the community level or homeowner association level, maybe you'd want to carry out a vulnerability assessment. And the vulnerability assessment could be focused on population, you know, a social vulnerability assessment. Or it could be uh, focused on critical assets like your police stations and your uh, infrastructure and your elementary schools. Um, you would want to inventory those critical assets and identify uh, the time frame that you want to plan in. And then you would begin going about assessing exposure, which we talked about, and vulnerability to the hazard, which in our case we're talking about flooding. So you would look, you would consult Delaware climate projections. Um, you would look at the FEMA floodplain um, and FEMA planning tool. You would look at how vulnerable populations in your community might be disproportionately impacted and really try to, to look holistically at the situation to understand exposure and vulnerability. And from there, you can begin prioritizing what's most vulnerable, what's most exposed and has less capacity to adapt. Um, sometimes it helps to think about risk tolerances in your community, are, are folks generally willing to put up with flooding on low-lying streets uh, once a month? What happens if that becomes more frequent, such as three or five times a month? And what if that, that street is flooded and stays out of commission for six hours at a time? Is that okay? What if it's longer? So having some consideration of those aspects, recovery times, risk tolerances, would help in establishing resilience goals. And then you can begin the process of identifying mitigation adaptation strategies. And throughout all this process, hopefully you're engaging the whole community for their input because getting all of their input and buy-in is critically important. And once you identify mitigation strategies, which is reducing risk or adapt adaptation strategies, which is finding ways to accommodate the flooding or live with the flooding, then you can begin develop, de developing an implementation plan. And you might build in points of that plan over time where you, you, know, you re revisit it and you see if there is a need to adapt and pivot um, the plans that you've put in place. Because the truth is, is we're, we do deal with some level of uncertainty with climate change. Um, and we've even seen that during COVID, you know, there was some uncertainty with how we would respond, you know, as a, as a population and whether a vaccine would work. And so you have to work with the uncertainty that you have. Just like when we go out and we go driving, we put on a seatbelt on the chance that we might get into a car accident. Or if we, we think there is a chance of rain, we're going to take an umbrella with us. We learn to adapt and to, to live with uncertainty. And we have to do that at the community level too. So having an adaptive management framework is important. Um, giving yourself time to kind of reassess and re-pivot as, as future data and conditions necessitate. Another great um, building block is, is simply the idea that you would plan to hire standards. Um, FEMA is, a, is the Federal Emergency Management Agency, you know, it regulates the federal floodplain, and it requires, not requires, but it encourages all of us to plan beyond the minimum standards that are part of the federal regulatory framework. That's, 
That means factoring in future conditions into all plans, designs, and policies. The, the two guides I have here on the screen, the homeowner's handbook is really helpful for homeowners um, in, in giving you design tips to help you retrofit or redesign or build your property um, to encourage more resilience. And then the guide on the left is a DENREC guide that was issued for state agencies, but really all of the tenants in it are great principles to apply at the community level too. It includes things like avoid building in the floodplain whenever possible. Maintain the natural and beneficial function of the floodplain by avoiding the use of fill and, and in, you know, ensuring that the, the normal conveyance channels are there. Um, they encourage you to incorporate designs um, and nature-based solutions that minimize risk. So for example, nature-based solutions might be um, large ample buffers between you know, development and the natural area, um, providing room for wetlands to migrate, um, using bio soils to capture storm water. And then they also encourage the participation in the community rating system, which is CRS. CRS is a voluntary incentive program that encourages community floodplain practices that exceed minimum requirements. The CRS communities that participate in it they receive discounts in national flood insurance program rates. So basically, if you're in a community, uh, an incorporated town that participates in CRS, and you have a federally, uh, a f you have federal flood insurance, then you're potentially receiving discounts to that insurance. Out of the 57 municipalities that are incorporated in Delaware, we have 10 that are participating in CRS, and one out of our three counties participate. So what that means is um, if you're in one of the counties that doesn't, the county that does participate is Newcastle. If you're in one of the other counties in an unincorporated part of the county and you happen to be a homeowner that has federal flood insurance, you are not receiving discounts. Um, and so there's plenty of room here for Delaware to do more with the CRS program. In fact, it can feel like a heavy lift. Basically what it's asking is, is for folks to adopt higher standards for floodplain management. So that could include at the community level, open space preservation or higher standards for design, um, outreach programs related to flood risk and resilience, things of that sort. But as Barnstable County, Massachusetts found out, you know, oftentimes some of the things that the town or county is doing anyway can qualify for CRS credit, such as mosquito, mosquito control. A lot of times that means, you know, de removing debris from stormwater systems and culverts and things like that, because you don't want the mosquitoes to, you know, to breed and, and accumulate. Well, that also has a benefit to flood management because it's freeing up those channels to convey the water. So there's plenty of win-win opportunities in CRS uh, for communities to take advantage of, which helps improve resilience overall. Another important um, building block, I call them social safety nets. Um, and it refers to things like our national flood insurance program. Um, so again, in Delaware, if you're in a high risk flood zone and you have a federally backed mortgage, you're required to carry flood insurance. Um, but time and time again, I run across homeowners that they've gone ahead and paid off their mortgage and they immediately drop their flood insurance, even though they've now accrued all this equity in their house. And the flood risk hasn't gone down. In fact, potentially over time, that flood risk may only go up. Um, there's also homeowners in Delaware that might, might live just across the street, you know, from a high risk area uh, on the FEMA floodplain map. Well, it doesn't mean that their risk goes to zero if they're not in that zone. So there's, there's still risk. In fact, FEMA says that 25% of its flood claims happen to occur outside of the uh, federally designated floodplain. So th there's, there's reason to really take heed and assess your own risk on your own property and potentially consider flood insurance as a safety net because flood damage can be very expensive and normal insurance does not cover flooding. Some homeowners might, might think, well, you know, if there's a, a major flood event, um, there'll be disaster funding available. And the fact is, is that that's pretty hard to meet a, that threshold for federal funding. 
in Delaware in particular, um, the federal government requires uh, that at least 25 homes must be completely destroyed for that designation. And there's, there's other factors, um, including that they don't count secondary residences in that calculation. So Delaware can sometimes have a hard time getting disaster declarations for individual assistance. And if individual assistance declarations are made, the payout is maybe not as much as you might think. It could be something like $5,000 or up to $35,000. So it doesn't necessarily cover um, you know, the full cost that you might be dealing with. Um, so that's why it's important to really cover yourself and have a, a safety net in place like the flood insurance program. Another, another tool um, is effective communications. Um, as a homeowner, making sure that if you have a cell in lieu of a landline, that you register your cell phone with the Delaware Emergency Notification System. And that link here is on the screen. Um, that pushes out emergency alerts regarding severe weather and other, other kinds of situations. And Smart 911, this, is a, this basically populates the 911 database with additional information about your household. So if you have a family member with epilepsy or who may be hard of hearing, you can note that in your profile. That information is only shared with emergency responders. So if they're on their way to call on your home, that information comes up and gives them more information to respond with. There's also, you know, social media tools that could be helpful to a community um, or a neighborhood. Nextdoor.com is frequently used um, to share information and news about events. And at the community scale, however one is pushing out information, it's so important to think about whether that communication tool is reaching all members of the community. In other words, what about members of the community that might not have internet? Maybe the, you know, the internet postings aren't going to be effective. Making sure that uh, information is translated into other languages, things like that, ensuring that we're really capturing uh, and reaching the whole community is important. And then lastly, um, I, can't, I can't emphasize enough the, the value of having networks and partnerships on the ground in a community to help with resilience. Um, during Tropical Storm Isaias, that impacted you know, a lot of communities north of Dover. We had major tornado damage, we had flooding in, in Newark, and um, the Delaware Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster, also known as the VOAD, they sprung into action. These are groups uh, that this network is made up of like the Red Cross and United Way and those kind of groups and Rubicon. And they went into the areas that were most impacted to help owners um, clean up debris. You know, large trees and other kinds of debris that were, um, you know, hitting roofs and across, laying across the yard. And, and that was really instrumental in helping the homeowners who otherwise wouldn't have had those kind of services available to them within easy, easy writ, reach or, you know, potentially funding available to, to do the removal. And during COVID, we certainly saw the value of local networks here in Sussex County, including CCC for COVID, which was a community group that sprung into action, basically just banded together to be a force multiplier. Basically the group just met frequently to identify needs and figure out where gaps were. Anything from food distribution to internet bandwidth to getting vaccines in the arms of our most vulnerable populations. And by working together, trading information and pooling resources, they were able to accomplish so much. So they, they really can be a force multiplier, they and any other network out there. And as, as we go forward in Delaware, we ought to think about what other networks can we groom that can be on the ground in place to support our recovery from future events and also our preparedness for future events. Because let's face it, we're living through an unprecedented event right now, the pandemic. And we've all had to learn how to adapt and to improvise and be flexible and pivot you know, as needed. And I think there's a lot of value in taking time to reflect on that and to um, you know, really document some of the lessons we've learned along the way. Put those into recovery plans for the future. 
put those into preparedness plans, because if we do that at the homeowner or community level, then we're going to be better prepared for the next event. And hence, we can shorten our recovery time for those next events. So that's where I'm going to leave you off. Um, and I hope you enjoy that. And I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you, Danielle. If you have any questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, our first question is from Laura, and she is asking about the 1.9 feet higher sea level rise that we're going to see by 2050. Her question is, does this sea level rise assume that the polar ice cap has totally melted? And if not, when the polar ice cap does melt, what will the sea level rise be then? It sounds like a math question for you. <laughs> I know, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, so the, the, I guess the short answer is that our sea level rise planning scenarios do factor in quite a number of inputs, including what happens with some of the polar ice melting. Um, and it was based on the most recent global models and regional models at the time. Um, but even since those uh, scenarios came out at the end of 2017, there's been additional learning and data to support future uh, planning and projections. Um, you know, I think if all of the ice were to melt, you would have a phenomenal amount of sea level rise. Um, so it's critically important as a society, we really see this as a, as a moment to really um, take stock and, and actively work to mitigate some of that. Okay, thank you. Our second question is from Tim and uh, he is referring to the storm back in 1962, which was caused by two stationary low systems, caused extensive damage and loss of life. And his question is, how does sea level rise compare to this event and how would it exacerbate another similar storm event? Great question. We're actually coming upon the 60th anniversary of the storm of 62 this next March. And Delaware Sea Grant is actually planning a major outreach event associated with that. So I, I hope you'll stay tuned on that. Um, but I think that, you know, we can take a lot of insights from that storm. That storm was a major event for, for coastal Delaware. Um, over the 60 years, we've had X number of additional people move into the, the flood zone, right? We've had additional infrastructure and property being built in that flood zone. So if you had the same exact storm today impact Delaware, you'd have so many more people impacted, potentially so many more, so much more damage um, to, to Delaware and its, and its residents. So sea level rise is one of the factors that exacerbates you know, those impacts because the height of the high tides and low tides are getting higher. So, you know, if you have a, uh, you know, the wind and the storm of, you know, storm tide coming in, that's only pushing inward coastally in, in and above the, the tide uh, that was predicted. So it's just, um, it's just an exponentially, you know, bigger factor. All right, thank you. The next question is from Sam, and he is asking, how does the contribution of decreasing wetlands and open space and increasing coastal development to coastal flooding compare to that of sea level rise? Well, that actually sounds like a very great topic that would be ripe for research. I don't, I don't know if I could give you a number offhand, but, but I think that essentially if you, if you have wetlands that are being encroached upon by development, then you're reducing sort of that natural floodplain that I talked about. And the natural floodplain has many beneficial functions. So nature is actually nature's best defense against nature. So we can pump in a ton of money and infrastructure and harden up, you know, our, our flood, you know, mitigation systems. But the truth is, is that we already have great flood mitigation systems in nature. So if we allow them to be preserved and intact and function the way they should, um, we'll all be, you know, more protected for it. So I know I'm not directly answering that whole question, but I think that's the best way I could approach that. 
All right, thank you. The next question is from Marty. If I am not in the FEMA 100 year floodplain, do I still need flood insurance? So I think that first depends on where you are and I, I don't know where your property is. So I would encourage you to look at the flood planning tool that was in the presentation or you can Google Delaware flood planning tool online. Um, input your property address and it'll show you where you are. But there's different, there's different parts of the floodplain. There's the high risk zones in the coastal area. You might uh, associate, associate those as VE and AE zones. But there's other parts of the floodplain that still have a potential for some storm, uh, storm risk over time. And I'm going to reduce my, my blinds for a minute here. So I'm getting quite a lot of glare. Um, and so in other words, is if you're not in the high risk area, it doesn't automatically mean that your risk is zero. You could be potentially in a 500 year floodplain. But to really know, you have to input your, your address into that tool so you can look it up. All right, thanks. Another question from Sam. The overlay map of flooding potential and density of older residents was really interesting. Might you have a similar overlay of flooding potential and income status? Those, those are you know able to do. We're basically looking at available data that's out there. So we have social vulnerability data that we tap into from the CDC and from other, other great sources. So we can look at in census, for example. So we could look at uh, income level. We could look at age of the population. We could look at number of households that have a single household member, those that have transportation available that compared to those that don't. I mean, there's a host of factors that are available to look at. And when you begin to tease out these different factors and group them together, you kind of get a holistic view of things. One of the things that my colleagues, Julio Hanlon and Nicole Minnie and I are working on this year is taking that one map that I showed you related to older adults, and we're building that out into a larger uh, online tool called DE Plans. And this is we're hoping to make this available uh, to our community leaders, social service agencies, and state agencies like DEMA. In fact, DEMA is going to house it. And it's going to basically collect a number of data sources related to older adults, um, including you know, not only the evacuation routes and the stuff that I showed you, but even you know, healthcare resources and uh, uh, other, you know, social services that are available and really put it all in one place to help facilitate, facilitate planning. And our hope is that over time, we'll expand that to other vulnerable populations too. All right, great. Uh, the next question is uh, somebody with the first initial of J. Is there any evidence of coastal Delaware sinking? Well, you know, coastal Delaware does experience land subsidence. Um, and it has a fancy name, glacial isostatic adjustment. And that is a holdover from the last ice age. So during the last ice age, the big ice sheet kind of stopped short of Delaware. And the, the sheer weight of that sheet de depressed the land. So imagine like if you're sitting on a, a mattress and you sit down and the land, I mean, I'm sorry, the mattress next to you pops up. Well, that's sort of what happened to Delaware. We popped up a little bit. And now over the, the thousands of years since the Ice Age, um, that land is slowly retreating back to where it was. So it, it's subsiding, you know, you could call it sinking. It's kind of coming back to its maybe original or natural state. Um, so yeah, we do experience some land subsidence that does factor in to some of our sea level rise. Um, rates and it is factored into the Delaware sea level rise scenarios. Okay, great. Uh, let's see, what is the best way to educate developers and Sus Sussex County Council about the need for mitigation planning? Great question. I think that first off, it's to see that there's lots of benefits to doing mitigation. And, you know, first and foremost, you're going to avoid costs of damage if and when we have a major catastrophic flood or storm event, you know, the, the cost, all the real estate that could be fact, that could be lost, you know, is substantial. Um, cost of lives, you know, how do you put a number on that? So to me, there's lots of cost benefits in taking 
steps to mitigate. And FEMA says for every dollar you invest, $6 avoided costs. But also I really see a potential where we work to sort of market and monetize resiliency. Right now, there's a lot of folks that are very attracted to the coast. They wanna move and get the water view. You know, that's very understandable. But imagine if new subdivisions were marketed as having, you know, higher standards and resilient design. So in addition to your granite countertops and your first floor master bedrooms, you're also moving, you know, potentially moving into a community with extra wide buffers and with, uh, you know, uh, elevated structures. Um, or, you know, you have um, other approaches that help minimize, you know, risk of flooding. I think there's an enormous opportunity for developers in the real estate community to seize on this opportunity and really embrace higher standards. Maybe they'll see a market for that. All right, thank you. Uh, our next question asks, have you implemented projects using nature-based solutions for coastal protection? such as oyster reefs, wetlands, seagrass, et cetera, in coastal Delaware? And if so, have you found one that is most effective? Ooh. Um, well, yeah, there's, there's all kinds of projects around Delaware. Um, and, you know, there's other colleagues I work with that have, have done a number of those projects. Uh, I'm working with the town of Slaughter Beach and Milford right now. And we are looking at um, investments uh, for nature-based infrastructure along the Mississippian and Cedar Creek watershed. But I don't know that I could tell you offhand one particular one that's better than all the others. I think that it really depends on the situation and what kind of metric you're really looking at. But certainly oysters are a phenomenal resource that could be used for building living shorelines, for example. Um, they're certainly beneficial to water quality. I mean, there's a lot of benefits that oysters bring, but uh, I don't think I could come up with a statistic for you offhand. Yeah, and if I remember, uh, Delaware Sea Grant is funding research to evaluate different um, nature-based solutions that hopefully in the next uh, few years we'll have, a, we'll have a better answer. All right, I don't see any more questions at this time, so I think we're going to wrap it up. Uh, I just want to mention again that this session was recorded and it will be available at um, on our website at some future date. And I also want to ask you to um, remember us for the next Ocean Currents lecture. This will occur on Thursday, July 1st at second, 7 o'clock. And this is uh, going to be a lecture by our College of Earth, Ocean and Environment Professor Emeritus David Kirchman and Jerry Kaufman, who is the Director of Water Resources Center at the University of Delaware Biden School for Public Policy. They'll be talking about dead zones. These are zones in the water that are low oxygen and can uh, increase mortality of uh, fish and other organisms in the water column. These occur in vital, um, vital bodies of water, such as the Gulf of Mexico, uh, our own Delaware Bay, as well as the Chesapeake Bay. So again, please join us on July 1st at seven o'clock um, for our next Ocean Currents lecture. Thank you.